to number 67 in times like these, and then after this song, we'll have the offering. 67 in times like these, and let's stand to sing. be seated. Andrew? Our dear Holy Father, we thank you this evening for uh, just giving us a chance to be able to be in your house, um, especially under these circumstances. Uh, we ultimately, uh, hopefully, as Christians, trust you and know that you are in control of this um, and that we, uh, you, you have our best interest in mind. Um, we thank you for a loving church and uh, just for the, the ministry that continues to take place here. Uh, we ask that your hand would still be on that and that uh, you would just continue to guide this church uh, in the direction that you'd have it uh, to go. Um, so just give us a, a good evening. Uh, we pray for this upcoming week and the things that you... Um, things that will be happening and, and the things that uh, we look for uh, to you for direction in and that uh, uh, that we uh, would just uh, continue to trust you in, in the guidance of those things. Um, just uh, be with the offering this evening and the, the, just the, uh, the money and the things that we need to do to take care of and uh, that, that your hand would be in that as well. In your precious name, amen.
Thank you. That was beautiful. All right, just before the message, let's turn in our Calvary Core Collections again to 39, Count Your Blessings. You want a mic? Do we have a mic still? Tim Baker would like a mic. This is sign language for, for I need a mic. Uh, <clears throat> as a side note, first of all, there's no Iwana, no school, no Iwana. Okay. No. But the primary thing I need to ask for, continued prayer for a young girl named Abby. Uh, I was able to get some churches in the area, names of churches, to Abby's mother that they can contact or help for her. But according to the gal I was talking to, Abby has not tried to cut herself recently. However, she's been to to the ER three times since January on the ambulance. This girl's got a real sin problem, real Satan problem she's cutting herself. I just wanted to continue asking for prayer for Abby. She's down in uh, Dear Dearborn Heights. So she's quite a ways from here, but I told her mom and her aunt to go keep her in prayer. And so I'm annoying you guys, keep her in prayer. Thank you. Thank you. that hand, Connie? I forgot to mention something. Uh, I wish you'd pray for the center. We only had one client this past week, and uh, so we got out early, and, and the Holy Spirit was talking to me about going to see and Phil's mama. And I was on my way home, and I just turned that car around, and I went back to see her, and she wore my legs out, as I wore hers out, as we're going up and down the hallway, and she was trying to talk to me, but the words weren't coming out quite right. But we sat on her little uh, couch inside her room, and, and she looked at me. <laughs> I am so glad that we have the Holy Spirit. She looked at me, and she said, thank you for coming. I couldn't, you couldn't understand anything else she said, but she said that, and I Thank you, God, because you used that opportunity. And that was also before they started shutting all these places down. So um, it is great to be able to, when you listen to the Holy Spirit and you do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do, yep. awesome. And it reminds me that, yes, Jesus cares, but lots of times he cares through us. We need to be open vessels to be used of God to care for others. All right. 39, count your blessings. Second verse only. Just play one verse. I don't care which one. Second verse only. Stand to sing because sometimes when things are tough, all the time when things are tough, it's a good thing to do is count your blessings to be thankful for what we have. Let's pray together. God, we have assembled uh, tonight in this place, and it means an awful lot to us. We continue to believe that uh, when we do it, especially with proper motive, that it's a sweet-smelling sacrifice to you. And I love studying your word together with your people in this place, and we certainly can collectively say, God, we, we love you, and love your word, and love your will, and love your work, and, and that prompts us to pray uh, 
uh, for your help as we seek to be faithful to all of these things. Pray that you be our guide again tonight as we uh, work our way through the pages of your book. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Our study in 2 Thessalonians continues. We're presently working our way through a section, uh, that is chapter 3, verses 6 through 15, where Paul is teaching the Thessalonians and us how to deal with an erring brother. In verse 6, we are commanded to withdraw from those who are walking disorderly. In verse 7, Paul testifies on behalf of him and Silas and Timothy that they have not walked disorderly. And because they have not walked disorderly, Paul in turn invites the Thessalonians and us to follow them or literally to mimic them. We said, oh, we said, oh, we said, oh, to be living lives like that so that people could, um, could be following us, or as Paul expresses it elsewhere, and you're familiar with this, be ye followers, this is 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be ye followers of me even as I am following Christ. We have... Uh, no misconceptions here. We certainly are not approaching the principle with pride. But the fact is, when we are following Christ, then we can invite people to follow us, and that's a wonderful thing. It relates a lot to our testimonies tonight. And really, God's message to us this morning and what he's been talking to us about for an extended period of time, that, that we would be living practically, righteously, it's good to know that people are not expecting perfection. They know better than that. But people continue to be impressed with faithfulness. And uh, we certainly trust that that more and more is marking us. We, we noted a little bit of irony with the principle, however, and that is people follow us. Uh, whether we are walking orderly or disorderly. And I'm trusting that God will keep that in our hearts and minds as well as we go about his business because it, it, it's an impactual principle. We have said it many times this way, you and I invariably take people with us. It is interesting that most of the time the people we take with us are the people that we love the most. And so that just adds to the significance of the principle and spurs us on to make sure that we are walking in an orderly fashion rather than disorderly. We, we pick up tonight with verse 8. Take a look as I read 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 8. Paul writing, Neither did we eat any man's bread for nothing. Love the simplicity of Paul's language here. Neither did we eat any man's bread for nothing, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. As our study unfolds, you understand more and more why Paul is a approaching things like this. And it'll be a joy for us to get together um, uh, later on, we trust, or at least for me to be preaching to the choir and, and to, um, uh, to put the puzzle pieces together. It, it's going to be neat for us to see that. Paul did something remarkable in regard to the uh, to the personal ministry that Christ, remember Paul had some intimate and personal dealings with Christ, even though Christ had already left the earthly scene. Paul did something remarkable in regard to the personal ministry Christ had entrusted to his care. While effectively paving the way for other ministers like Pastor Tom, to be fully supported by their ministry, Paul personally chose not to be. Now, you know the narrative in regard to Paul, and he was often the recipient of uh, significant gifts in regard to various churches, and so it wasn't that Paul wasn't being blessed in that realm, but especially in dealing with the church in Thessalonica. When he shows up there on the scene, he does so with the intent that he is not going to depend upon them meeting his physical need. 
on the one hand, then Paul campaigns for the elder, the bishop, the pastor, the minister, even the missionary to be fully supported by his ministry, saying such things as, and you'll, this will ring a bell to you, don't muzzle the ox, and the laborer is worthy of his hire, and they who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So Paul's covering all of the bases, but we're meeting up with him at a time when, in dealing with the church at Thessalonica, that he's choosing to not take advantage of this clear biblical and divine provision. And again, we're going to understand more as, our, more as to why he is doing this as, uh, as our study unfolds. I will tell you that Paul is not pushing for a pattern then. He's doing something here that uh, is a personal choice on his part, although it's clear that Silas and Timothy also join him. Paul clearly is not pushing for a pattern regarding his personal choice here. He knew going forward, in fact, it's his teachings that we ultimately depend upon for this, uh, he knew going forward that the local church would be greatly blessed with a minister who was fully supported by the ministry so that the man would be able to devote himself to prayer and the study and teaching and preaching of the scriptures. God, by the way, you're to be commended because God, by the way, hasn't changed in regard to that. Even though our world has changed and even though, um, you know, there are pressures on the church to change, the fact of the matter is God has held his line. Can't tell you how much I appreciate our deacon board and the deacons that make up the board. And that's Acts 6 stuff, right? Where that's Acts 6 stuff where to pave the way for the, the elder, the bishop, to stay in tune with this twofold calling of God on his life to be in much prayer and to be in much study that they uh, formulated this office in the church. Again, our deacon board is to be commended in their personal approach to me. I can just uh, testify to you, and this has been um, basically consistently true is that they have been a, a tremendous uh, blessing and a support to me in regard to that. I'm rereading verse 8. Paul writes, Neither did we eat any man's bread for nothing, but wrought with labor and travail, night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. This is actually, actually the second time Paul has said this to the Thessalonians, which tells you that they didn't get it the first time. And that's going to come into play down the road, too, as we put all the puzzle pieces together. But uh, just turn back to 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9 so that you see that. For they themselves, uh, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 2 and verse 9. I, let me get to the right place. For you remember, notice the similarity in the language and even the terms. For you remember, brethren, this is 1 Thessalonians. This is his first letter to them. Chapter 2 and verse 9, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travel, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. So Paul is actually, here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 8, he's actually reiterating. And I want to do a little bit of semantical work with you. The, the word not, I didn't make a notation as to what the other translations render, but let me, let me talk to you a little bit about the, the Greek word that is here. Paul writes, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught or for nothing. You'll be interested in this. The Greek word is found, two, uh, found nine different times in the New Testament, and six of the times it's translated as freely or free. And so I'm back to looking at the simplicity of Paul's words here, and I appreciate that. He literally says, we didn't eat man's bread for free. In other words, again, at this time, he is communicating both to the Thessalonians and to us that 
uh, that, that they cared, that is Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they actually cared for both their food and their shelter. And then Paul says this, quote, we labored and traveled night and day. These are strong terms in, in both the, the English and the Greek. The, the word labor, it's a Greek word, kapos. It comes from the verb kapto, which means to cut. We've, I, I recall talking about the term before, and so you may actually recall some of this. But what Paul is going to do, I'll just prep you for this, and it will govern our thinking certainly for the rest of our time here tonight. Paul is going to revisit with God's people a proper work ethic. He uses the word labor, it's a Greek word, kapto, which means to cut, and the idea here is that you're working so hard, if you applied it to, to the physical aspect of work, you, you wouldn't be surprised if you got a scratch or a cut, that you're working that hard. And maybe from an emotional standpoint, because the word means to cut or to chop, and maybe from an emotional standpoint, you are laboring so hard that it feels like you're being chopped. Part of the reason why Paul is rehearsing that with us is because you and I, and I'm speaking primarily of myself, but you and I have a natural tendency to, to move away from hard labor like that. And something that was a tremendous encouragement to me and actually an ongoing and good challenge for me, because we often get weary, I am speaking out of ministry, like spiritual things, and you guys would be able to relate to that because we just came through a wild game dinner. We have, this, we have this significant wild game dinner committee. We have scores of people that are assisting them. They put tons of hours and time and energy, blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah, you even see blood. They get cut in all of the orchestration of this thing. And, and, and man, we, we, you know, they and then we and many other scenarios, we, we are often to the point of exhaustion where we're, we're just so tired and I don't know how you will receive this, but I receive what Paul is saying here, and it ultimately comes from God, is that God actually expects us to work like that, to work hard. So rather than being discouraged, you know, by saying, man, I'm just tired. I often think of our Wednesday nighters, and again, this is sort of a, a stereotypical scenario, but boy, a lot of our people work on Wednesday, are still employed, and they work on Wednesday, and, and, and they uh, show up on Wednesday night, and sometimes they show up in their work clothes. Why? Because they didn't have enough time to go home and change. I'm telling you again, I am certain that that is a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God. And, and God his provision is big enough for us that he actually expects that in us. I guess I'm saying to you and to me, it's okay if we're tired from time to time. It's okay if once in a while we work to the point of exhaustion. It's actually a biblical principle. And so, uh, you know, again, this may primarily be for me, but I appreciate uh, the, the reminder know the word travail. Again, our women would be able to appreciate that. And we don't use the term, I don't think, very much anymore. And yet, even though there's some middle English, old English to the term, the fact of the matter is we know what the word means through and through, and especially our mothers. But again, Paul's talking about spiritual labor, and so he has the audacity of applying it to the ministry that God had entrusted to his care and to Silas's and to Timothy's as well. I want to, again, forgive me for belaboring this. I, I want to embrace that challenge. I, I want to be willing to work and to work hard. I want to be willing to have a few scrapes and bruises, whether it's physical or emotional or even spiritual. Because, again, God deserves that. I do remind you, I know you know it well, it again relates to your testimonies and so it's often a reminder to me, but we, we 
have been saved, rescued, delivered, redeemed, made righteous. We have every reason and all motivation to live out our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is my ongoing prayer, first for me and then for you. But did you know that? God expects you not only to work, but to work hard. And so we're back to this proper, a, a biblical and proper work ethic. I do remind you, especially with our view to Genesis, that you recall, it was a while ago, but you recall we, we found this to be interesting. Again, it helps with our apologetic in regard to these things. God had, boy, you got to get a kick out of this. God had no more than made Adam, and then he stuck him in the garden, and he said, get to work. Isn't that interesting? It was before the fall. You know, you and I could easily fall into the thinking, the misunderstanding that work is a part of the curse of sin. But we were reminded even through our study in Genesis that it existed long before the fall, and that it's God's intent that you and I would work and that we would work hard. And not only in the f spiritual realm, but also in the physical realm. The Thessalonians had forgotten this. That's why, by the way, and there's an inseparable link to this, where you, where you and I arrive at a place where we have left off a proper biblical work ethic, and then you know what we quickly become. We become busybodies. So it's going to be neat to see that relationship, too. I got all kinds of things I'm looking forward to and and uh, we're living in a day and age where you're starting to wonder whether we're even going to be able to get to them. A biblical work ethic, I want to leave you with this. We have uh, just, the right, right, just the right amount of time to consider this together. I, this will be an interesting slant. A little bit unique approach to God reminding us of a proper biblical work ethic. I'd like you to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. You, you're familiar with the book, and, and uh, boy, th this is so interesting. And we'll get there. i got to get there probably before you or try to, but uh, we, we know that uh, Solomon is is the human author in regard to this book. I, I'm reminding you, even before we read, and that's what we'll do, we'll take two little courses here in regard to um, what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes regarding the, um, regarding the um, biblical work ethic. But before we even read, I'm reminding you that and this is a unique scenario with Ecclesiastes that's unlike any of the other books in the Bible. Solomon, uh, for the course of the book, is writing as if there's nothing above the sun. This is interesting. 29 times in this book, he uses um, the, the, the phrase, uh, what, what is it, class? What is it? Van vanity is used even more times, yes, but um, under the sun. I, I got it, sorry. 29 times he uses the phrase under, un under the sun. And we initially said, well, Solomon, what do you mean by that? And when you look at it contextual, it's this idea that although Solomon knew God, he was actually writing as if he didn't. Although Solomon knew that there were many things above the sun, including God and heaven, he actually writes as if there wasn't. He knows better, and he even has a personal relationship with this God, and yet he's writing as if he doesn't. And so because of that, we often, as we work our way through the book of Ecclesiastes, we're often taken back by what he says, and then we have to be reminded of the entire approach and, th and flow of the letter, and when we are, we, we understand 
that he's speaking almost as if he was a worldling. And this will provide us with the two trains of thought, of, of, of thought through the book of Ecclesiastes in regard to um, a work ethic. So take a look, first of all, at verse 3 of chapter 1. So we'll just p pick these up very quickly. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? That's a rhetorical question. And the, the, and the presumed answer is there, there's no profit. So you can tell as Solomon begins the letter that he's, he's got this perspective even on work. A and he's... He's uh, tying it to the word vanity, that even work is vain. And, and God's people would say, well, wow, are you sure about that? And take a look at chapter 2 and verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no prophet, here's the phrase again, under, 29 times under the sun. And verse uh, 18, I believe it is. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that should be after me. And verse 22. For what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun. Solomon here is sounding an awful lot like the worldling. And it reminded me of some of the bumper stickers that we see from time to time. Like, I owe, I owe, off to work I go. Which makes work almost a necessary evil. And this, work fascinates me. I can, I can sit and watch it for hours. And of course, and I actually have a t-shirt like this, all of the I would rather be stickers and t-shirts. I'd rather be hunting, fishing, cross-stitching, canning, I guess canning is work, but for some of you it's a hobby. Skiing, sailing, camping, you got the idea. Someone has said that, and I'm quoting, in our materialistic self-indulgent society, many people play at their work and work at their play. But as you know, and we close with this, throughout Ecclesiastes, little rays of light keep coming through. It's sort of neat to look at the book from that perspective. Little rays of light come through, and, and, and um, because of that, every once in a while, we are able to meet up with, the, with uh, Solomon where he is setting forth God's perspective on work. And I'm leaving you with this. So chapter 2 and verse 24. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it is from the hand of God. Take a look at verse 13 of chapter 3. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. And chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. These verses will ring a bell. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. What Paul is doing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 
um, from verse 6 following is he is going to be reminding God's people of a proper work ethic, and that is going to lay a foundation for Paul's further teaching. And I'm certainly looking forward to considering that with you. i got to let you go. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these things. We sure appreciate you. We sure appreciate your word. We sure appreciate its practicality. And this is a good reminder, especially for me. A biblical, proper work ethic. I, not, I, I ought not to squawk at the times when I'm very tired, when I and we have had the privilege of loving you and serving you and obeying you and ministering for you. So this is a good reminder for us. And ultimately, with, uh, with a proper understanding of it, it's a tremendous encouragement. Bottom line is you, God, expect us to work but not that alone, but to work hard. I pray that we would. I, I pray that we would work hard at our personal approach to you. I pray that we would work hard at our pursuing you through your word. I pray that we would work hard at prayer. I pray that we would work hard at sharing, and as we've heard of tonight, building bridges into people's lives. So be blessed as we obey you in these realms, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn again in our Calvary Choral Collections to number 22, Take the Name of Jesus with You. We'll stand and sing verse 1 of 22. Father, thanks so much. As we go from this place, help us take your name with us to be a witness, a light to others who need you so badly. Use this, Lord, for you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.